You're listening to the Entrepreneur's Agony Aunt podcast. Keeping it real, telling the story like it is, because there are no mistakes that somebody else hasn't already made. Hello, I'm Vicky Brock, and you're listening to the Entrepreneur Agony Aunt podcast. My guest this week is James McElroy, founder and CEO of Enterobiotics, an award-winning and rapidly expanding biotechnology company that he started while at medical school. It's focused on using the body's own microorganisms to prevent and treat debilitating infections and diseases. At the same time as growing his team, raising a seed round, and now moving on to further investment, getting his technology to market. He also recently completed his degree in medicine from the University of Aberdeen, graduating with distinction and the elective prize in chaired health, and was appointed as an honorary lecturer in healthcare innovation to the School of Medicine. If that wasn't enough, while studying medicine and building his company, he was awarded the Enterprise Fellowship to the Royal Society of Edinburgh and a visiting research fellowship by United European Gastroenterology. So welcome to the podcast, James. Thank you for that. And thank you for having me in your lovely kitchen. <laughs> it's a shame my mum wasn't still here to hear that introduction. I think she would have been very pleased to hear all of that. <laughs> well, so I have to listen to this episode. So I'm going to keep it to one question this week because I'm so uh, looking forward to hearing all of the stories that you have to tell me. But um, really interesting question because it's coming from a startup employee. Mm. Uh, but I've been asked this by founders mm. on the other side of the table as well. Mm. Um, and it is, I've recently become employee number one in a startup. The founder is really, really busy doing everything and anything and brought me in because I compliment her skills and can take a lot of her hands. But she isn't giving me anything to do or using me to the best advantage. How do I help my founder shift their mindset from being a one-woman band to being an employer who has a mm. business to grow? Mm. <laughs> Um, well, Anybody I'm guilty of that sin right around this table? We're, we're both looking at each other <laughs> in a sheepish and, manner and, and, and nodding our heads because uh, I think we, well, I, I certainly am absolutely 100% guilty of doing just that. Yeah. Um, but learning to delegate and building your team must be mm-hmm. something that you've had to make work as a founder, given that all these plates that you've been yeah. spinning. Before we dive in, you know, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what you've been doing and, and your journey as a, as, a, as a CEO and entrepreneur to this point. Absolutely, I'd, I'd be more than happy to. So um, things got kicked off for me um, when I took a year out of medical school to do something called an intercalated degree, uh, which some medical students can do uh, at another university. And I went to Edinburgh University to study physiology. And that was the first time in three years of university that I had a chance to just kind of learn for the sake of learning and had free reign outside of the curriculum to read about stuff I was genuinely interested in. I can remember being up late at night in one of these um, 24-hour computer laboratories um, in the old town in Edinburgh. And I was looking for a topic to write my dissertation on. And you know when you're going from YouTube video to YouTube video and you and you end up somewhere that you you just have no idea how you got there. Yeah, in a really strange place. I, I was doing that with academic papers. Really nerdy, I, I, I guess a really nerdy thing to do. And I can remember coming across this paper that um, basically showed that if you transfer bacteria from a thin mouse into the digestive tract of an overweight mouse, then the overweight, overweight mouse lost weight. And the, and the other way around. And the other way around so as well, yes. yeah. I was fascinated I was to learn like, that. I was like, oh my God, this is, this is amazing. What is, what is this all about? How does this work? I'd never come across anything like that at medical school. And I actually had been largely oblivious to this other world, um, which is the, the world that we can't see with our naked eye. We're literally covered from top to bottom, inside and out in these little microorganisms. And this paper showed me that they potentially play a really important aspect to keeping us healthy and, and our normal physiological function. So that got me really interested. And I kept reading about this concept of transferring bacteria from one organism to another. And soon after, realised that they were doing it in human beings. Mm-hmm. And they were literally transferring people's poo from one person to another to cure and treat disease. And I can remember coming across another paper published by a group of Dutch researchers um, which basically showed that this concept, now known as faecal transplantation, cures around 90% of patients in the hospital suffering from a debilitating and life-threatening infection 
caused by a bacteria called C. diff, which historically has caused a lot of problems in, in Scotland. And that's, di- that's like super diarrhea, is it? Yeah, yeah, super diarrhea, fever, stomach cramps, and it can kill you. Basically, the C. diff bacteria produces two toxins, which can cause big problems for the inside lining of your intestinal tract, and people can become very sick. And, and I think around about 10% of people with a C. diff infection, if they're elderly and have other problems, will end up dying, unfortunately. So very, very mm. sad. And this was 90% cure rate. And I was like, whoa, yeah. this is unbelievable. I've never come across anything like this before. But that started what has been really a fascination and a passion about this new frontier in medicine, mm. the, the gut bacteria and how manipulating these gut bacteria could prevent and treat disease. Uh, and I quickly realised that although we had this very effective medical treatment, faecal transplantation proven in an academic clinical trial setting, it was very difficult for doctors to perform. And there's quite a lot of restrictions around it as well, aren't there? Well, there is, and I'll come on to that in a second, but people are kind of doing it themselves, right? Because it's difficult for them to now access. Now I'm thinking about YouTube videos that yeah. take you to weird places. There we go, yeah. Yeah, DIY so, fecal transplants, let's not go there. Well, that, that is a thing, and I came across that. And people are doing it themselves. Why? Because they're desperate. Yeah, why are people doing it themselves? And you're right, because there's restrictions on who can manufacture and distribute the, the fecal material, like blood. It's a highly regulated thing. Long story short, I realised that we had a highly effective treatment available for patients. It was very difficult for them to perform, and we didn't have a blood transfusion service equivalent for faecal material. And I said, well, if no one else is going to do something about that, then I'm going to give it a go, and formed the company, which back then was called Aberdeen Faecal Therapy Limited, and just got cracking. Yep. Um, I had, really, I had no idea what I was doing at all, but I had this vision in my mm-hmm. mind setting up this service and I thought that was going to be fantastic and um, I got my, my physiology degree from Edinburgh went back to Aberdeen and started my fourth year which is our which is our longest year um, and our written finals are in fourth year and I just kept going with it and mm-hmm. kept developing it refining the idea speaking yeah. to doctors speaking to potential customers people in the healthcare industry I ended up getting this enterprise fellowship from the Royal Society of Edinburgh just before my final written exams and I kind of now I'm finished medical school I can speak freely but I kind of had to tell a little white lie to the medical school and a little white lie to the Royal Society of Edinburgh to say look this is a part-time thing and then then said the medical school trust me I'm an entrepreneur it's fine it's no no problem don't worry it'll all be fine and I didn't really tell the Royal Society that had these exams coming up because I was confident that I could manage it anyways so um the enterprise fellowship gave me a little bit of extra money to be able to go out and, and, and do things and I got some fantastic business training for a year got the concept to an idea a sort of a, a, a readiness where people were willing to put some money into it in March last year um, raised £500,000 of seed investment led by Equity Gap supported by the Scottish Investment Bank mm-hmm. and some other high net worth individuals to set up the budget infusion service equivalent yep. for fecal manufacturing and distribution and in the last year we've pretty much done that we've set up one of the world's first ISO accredited control donation facilities to collect people's stool. We've set up a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility in Aberdeen. We've staffed them both, integrated them, manufactured our first products. We've applied for a regulatory license to do this and to give you an idea about how it's regulated. It's an unlicensed product from a licensed facility. Um, now we're sort of towards the end of a Series A fundraise. And uh, I completed my final year of medical school over the course of the last year. And as you said in the introduction, graduated on Friday last week. So it has many been a congratulations for course. all of those things okay. occurring simultaneously. Now, so like, how the heck did you manage your time? So I think that I, I prioritised looking after myself and my own health mm-hmm. as near to the top of the list. That's so sensible. I wish I'd done that. Because no one else will do it for you, will they? <laughs> No. no, they don't. And you don't, you, you can't run for years and years with cortisol filling your brain and on adrenaline and at emotional full tilt without suddenly waking up one day going bam. Absolutely. I mean, I, I woke up one day mm. ill for the first time right. and mm. at the worst possible time mm. in my business. So that's such mm. a sensible thing to so, do. So yeah, prioritizing going to the gym. Um, and I think that it's possible certainly for me, to do very intense sprints with full-on medicine, full-on company, but then there has to be a bit of downtime after because no one can run at 100 miles an hour the whole time. Your 100-meter mm-hmm. sprinters can do 100 meters, and that's really just yeah. about it. And I think that as a person, you need to kind of work out what your baseline is and when you can do peaks and troughs because mm-hmm. no one can do a peak all the time because yeah. you just burn out. On the athlete theme, I think, it's, I think it's really important for people that are taking on challenges to think like an athlete. 
An athlete's got a team of people around them to help them. Physiotherapists, nutritionists, mm-hmm. um, doctor, coach, etc. And I think it's really important to get into that mindset if you want to win uh, when setting a big challenge. So this sounds really silly, but I, I looked at my, my sort of week plan and thought, where am I losing time? Where can I gain time leading up to these exams to maximise my productivity? What's going to be high yield? Mm-hmm. Is spending £30 on someone to help me clean my flat high yield? Yes, it probably is. Yep. Is spending a little bit of money on someone to help me with my clothes high yield? Probably, yeah. Can I improve my efficiency on where I'm getting my food and how I'm preparing it? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I became very, very good and very adept at maximising my time and making high yield decisions. Mm-hmm. And that's interesting because I used to do a process of like taking out stupid decisions and I think that Mark is a good book does this. You know, I literally would eat up and I still do actually yeah. exactly the same thing yeah. for breakfast every day. Yeah. When I was, you know, running my last company, yeah. exactly the same thing for dinner every evening. Yeah. I just would buy five of them and I yeah. didn't think I'd just come in and do that because yeah. that was just two minutes that did not require my brain involved in I, any of this. I agree entirely. I think it's really important to try and focus on things that are really high yield and I see high yield all the time for lots of things, but there's only so many hours in a day. So if you are super, super, super busy and your inbox is getting smashed with loads of emails and you've got an exam coming up, you need to think to yourself, what is high yield here? And as I went through medical school, I started prioritizing more and more high yield medical stuff. So I wasn't learning about the one in 100,000 super rare syndrome or disease that probably isn't going to come up in the exam. Mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on the basics and get really good at them. And with the company stuff as well, and we'll talk about building a team and delegating, I'm now spending much more time focusing on what's highest yield for me and where I can bring the most value into enterobiotics. And that, as it happens, is not about being in the lab, working in the lab, mm-hmm. setting up the processes, being detail focused, um, accounts, all that kind of stuff. That's not really me. Mm. Um, I don't know if it's you either. I think you're sort of. I like the fi- Yeah, I like data and finance. Mm. I mean, I do like finance mm. a lot, but I'm like, I hate mm. process and I hate admin. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'll be the first person to. to me too. One of my first <laughs> hires. I mean, I've already done it in this business, and I don't have a business exactly yet. Mm. Stuff, but I've already got somebody mm. working with me, doing mm. my admin and That's seeing it. my inbox and helping me get my Trello board set up, and That's and it. just because I'm just rubbish at that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, but that's typical of a really high energy, strategic thinking, visionary entrepreneur. And it's the same as me. And and once you've started your own business, you can sort of decipher and distill and titrate out what what, what is not high yield for you and help. And you've done it before. So now you know immediately to make things move quickly, you need someone else to help you with that. So to summarise on what I've said so far, look after yourself, eat well. Um, I I know other entrepreneurs who um, I think are teetering on the edge of real mental and physical breakdown. Yeah, I see see it too. They prioritise the wrong things. And the boring stuff is good for you unfortunately and it's really important if you are to run a marathon to fuel your body with the right stuff and and everything like that so looking after yourself is super important building a team around you that can help you and that's not just business mentors it's your whole life really and trying to pull together the resources you need and then a few other things i think are really important i listened to a previous podcast about quitting and you were like (laughs) don't quit is bad advice and i i understand I, i do understand where you're coming from in that regard but I got into this mindset and that nobody in the world was going to stop me from doing these two things and completing. I would have run yeah. myself into the ground before. I... Yeah, and I suppose what I meant was with that is don't quit at any cost mm. is bad advice. The cost is everybody in your life. Mm. If the cost is mm. your personal health, there's actually, you know, sometimes you need to pivot mm. your own thinking. Mm, 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 and if that means stopping doing mm. something, what do I stop yeah, no, I get that. So it's almost like having a list of what I'm not doing. Okay, I think I agree with that. As much of a list as what mm. I was mm. doing. Mm-mm-mm-mm. No, I think mm. I agree with that, actually. Yeah. So well, I guess what I was getting at was that I had I was positively reinforcing to myself every day that I could do this. Oh, yeah. Loads of positive energy all the time. So I think that visualising success and telling yourself you can do it is really important too because I think mind over matter is, is a big Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And I have to say, I, I would say my last business, and perhaps it's because it wasn't my first, hmm. 
I spent less time needing to do that mm. because I absolutely believed I could do it. Yeah, that's excellent. And it, I suppose it's, it's, and it remains my mm. biggest point of mm. frustration mm. Mm. You know, with how all that went. It was like, damn, mm. that should have worked. Mm. And then so I haven't had to do so much. You know, going into this one, mm. like the point of frustration has been mm. more finding a vision worth committing Got it. the next five years you know of you my can life do to. It. That's really, yeah. I, I suppose you've really been through the mill and, 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 and you've had so many of these difficult experiences and you've come out on the other end in good health and ready for action again. So I think that's immensely positive and you've built a lot of resilience as well doing and that. But building that up when you're doing that, coming in as you are for mm. the first time, I think you're absolutely right. Mm. In the end, if you're not completely obsessed with that vision, mm. it's never going to work. I mean, well, if you're not I was going to say that, that as well. Thing, it just can't work. Oh, cause... If you are going to commit to doing many different things at the same time, and that could be running a business and starting a family at the same time. It could be running a business and looking after a loved one who's poorly at the same time. It could be studying like I've done and running a business at the same time. It might be nothing to do with the business. It might be running a marathon and doing normal work. You need to be passionate about it or you need to be able to get passionate about it because it would be too easy to give up and you need grit. And and when you're really excited about something, it's infectious. And when we talk about first employees and building the team, that infectious enthusiasm is really powerful, I think. Because mm. people will join you with nothing, really. Oh, absolutely. And I suspect that's what's happened with the person that's asking this question. It's yes. like, I believed in this whole vision. Yeah. I wanted to be part of this. Absolutely. Let me be part of this and help yep, you. I agree. So um, um, the question was about first employee joining what sounds to be like your sort of typical high energy, <laughs> chaotic hurricane yep. of, a, of a founder. And being frustrated because she's not getting as much work as she thinks she can do and therefore is not adding the value that she thinks she can add yeah. to this business. And it's about how to articulate that to the founder without them getting upset. Yeah. So I, I think both of us can relate to that founder and we can put ourselves in their shoes because we've both been there ourselves. You know, when you start something, it really is your baby and, and you can't envision or imagine anyone else doing the jobs that you're doing because you're doing it. Mm-hmm. But there will become a time, and hopefully it's relatively soon, when this founder realises that they're not good at everything, as much as you want to believe you are. Yeah. And um, basically, we'll start to delegate uh, to people who are better at doing those jobs than they are. And that will free up more time for the founder to do what they're really good at. So I think it's about taking a bit of a patient approach, actually, with this founder. If they really believe in this founder's ability and really believe in the vision and really believe in the potential of the business that they started, I would wait a little bit and get to know them a little bit better and watch and figure out what they're actually really good at and then figure out how you can slot in and add the most value. And I wouldn't, in the first instance, be too upfront and sit them down and go, I need more work. I wouldn't I wouldn't do that because I think that the founder might, like anyone, be really protective and withdraw. Yeah. So I would say something along the lines of, well, this is what we're doing week to week. And this is what you're doing week to week. This is what I'm currently doing. Gosh, it seems that like you're doing an awful lot. And actually, you're really, really good at that. So why don't I try and do this? Yeah. And I, I can't give a more sort of granular or, or I can't really crystallize what those examples would be because I don't know either of them. But I would take a sort of long game and watch the founder and then pick out little bits that they think they can help with. And then go, I'll just, let me just do that. And then nail it. Yeah. Absolutely smash it. And then go, hang on, I can just keep doing this. And then slowly tease out and pull away those jobs from the founder. I don't know if you agree with me or not. but Yeah, it's interesting. The, the I have two, two approaches that I've used on mm. myself. Mm. Mm. The first, very similar to what you were talking about mm. earlier, actually, mm. More of a matrix mm-hmm. where I have literally sat down and go, okay, right, mm. you know, little time but little value, mm. high time but little mm. value, mm. high time, high value, mm. and, and mapped my time out that mm. way, mm. which is kind of what they say in the memory of books to do. Yeah. But these days, what I do is just literally a list. Yeah. What I love, what I hate, yeah. <laughs> and when I when I, I'm working with a co-founding team who mm. we don't know each other right yeah. now at the moment, and I've got everybody. Literally mm. filling in what I love, what I hate, nice. you know, what my, the thing that really gets yeah. me going sure. is. It was, it was really constructive. I mean, I did it face to face with mm. someone, but I've always also got us to fill it in. And it, it's funny how quickly mm. you start to see your clusters of skills and interests in people. I mean, mm. like, I'm like, I, I love, you know, doing the rah 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 stuff. I love mm. getting out there. I love speaking. Mm. I love meeting people. I love mm. the whole vision and selling the vision mm. and the ideas and the possibilities. And I hate the admin and I'm rubbish at follow up mm. and 
Mm-hmm. I can't design a process t- to save my life. Mm-hmm. But then there's like somebody else in this mm-hmm. mix going, mm-hmm. oh, you know, what? I really like to kind of like get this map down. And yeah. Like, we need a tool for this. And I've seen this type of process work extremely well. Yeah. Although in certain contexts, this process works best. Yeah. Like, well, you know, I operate in different situations. Yeah. I'm like, whoa. Yeah. Ninja skills. So I, 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 I agree with pretty much everything you've just said. And what I would say though is that the founder might know themselves that they're not delegating enough but they don't know how to because it might be their first time. And that was kind of the same, that was kind of how I felt when, when I started. I knew that I wasn't good at everything and I didn't know how to delegate and how to manage people and how to set targets and how to put process in because I'd never had that. I was just straight from university. Mm-hmm. Hadn't even finished my university degree. So how did you do it? Well, it just kind of happened. Like, um, I remember when, when I met Nick, who was one of our first employees, um, hugely experienced in setting up laboratories, production facilities and I had tried to get good at that over the course of the year preceding meeting him mm-hmm. learned as much as I could met as many people as I could bought them coffees scribbled notes got it all in my head uh, and then I met Nick and um, I knew I needed help because I didn't really know where to go next mm-hmm. and Nick was actually retired so it was only supposed to be a one day a month type of coffee chat etc I remember ne- met Nick and, and I was like this is what I've done here's where I want to go how far away do you think I am? And I remember he was like, have you done this? I was like, no, have you done that? I was like, no, have you done that? And I was like, no. And I probably said no to about 100 Mm. things. And he was like, oh God, it's quite a lot to do. And I was like, okay, fair enough. But this is where I want to go. Do you want to come and help me? Yeah. And I will, I think to be a really good leader, you have to inspire people to lead and give people autonomy to just, you know, do their thing. Absolutely. And give them the resources they need to kind of kick ass, if you like. Yeah. And I I, I remember I said to Nick, well, look, if you can could just join i'm happy to let you just do that and be that guy and i will try not to interfere the only thing i interfere in i guess is time scale because i want it all done yesterday oh yeah and i get they get really frustrated with me they're like james for god's sake like give yourself some wiggle room yeah i did an interview with one of my former employees about three things that she wished the ceo understood yeah and number two was it actually does take time. Yes. <laughs> I'm not just saying that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was funny. I was that after taking a bit of time, I really needed some help on the detail stuff, the process stuff, the administration, the um, setting up infrastructure, quality management systems, all that kind of stuff, which I'm just really rubbish at. And I can remember uh, there was this guy called Gregor who listens to your podcast coincidentally. So he is, he is, he is going to hear this. And um, I was saying, I need, a, I need an operations guy. I really need one because we're starting to commercial, we're starting to get close to commercialization things are happening there's lots of moving parts employees purchase orders going in and out stock levels that need to be kept in check etc etc i need someone that can help me with that and i, and I can remember uh meeting uh, gregor and being like this is this is what the kind of position i'm hiring and uh, he was like so so what, what do you think i'm going to be doing now, in my head i was like i don't really know but i remember i said yeah 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 i know i need you i was like i don't really know but i remember saying to him everything yeah. <laughs> i need you to do everything yeah. now after working with me for six months he's really found his niche and is adding so much mm-hmm. value to the business because he's doing the stuff he's really good at and i've got more time to do the stuff that i think i'm good at yeah so i think with this founder they might be aware of the fact that they're not delegating enough and might not know how to do it. And that might need to be teased out of them. So I guess there's two strategies. One is to observe and wait and slowly pick up bits and pieces, but that requires patience. The other strategy would be to be more upfront and to do it in a more social situation, I guess. So go Mm -hmm. out for dinner and say, look, I I, I really love what you're doing, love the vision, but I feel like I could do a little bit more and come to them with the solution. Do you know what I mean? Come to them with the plan mapped out because that's what they're good at and say, this is what I think I can do. Let's do a trial run. And if they're a good leader and they've got potential to to continue being a good ceo then they'll probably say yeah let's do it yeah you know I, mean? I think you're right i think there, there's definitely a danger in that being very confrontational and mm-hmm. this whole tell me what i should be doing yeah because i i used to find um That's hard, mostly i didn't have i mean mostly i hired well and i didn't mm-hmm. have that but i did sometimes have people who were literally like, tell me what i should yeah. be doing yeah now, A, I found that intensely stressful, but B, yeah. I also found it like, oh, I don't know. Like, mm. if I knew how to do your mm. job, mm. That's it. I'd tell you, but yeah. I don't. You're filling a huge void in my skill gap and yep. in the company's skill gap. Yep. So I don't even know enough about what you do yeah. or how to do what you do to yeah. turn that into a task yeah. list. All I can do is tell you where we're going, yeah. tell you what I need you to achieve, mm. and you 
you tell me basically yeah. and not everybody likes that not everybody is meant to be in a startup mm. work in a startup mm. i think there are people who go wow that sounds mm. scary but mm. i'm gonna jump in with two feet yeah and there are other people who like dip the toe in the water and go no i can't uh, do this or they or they kind of make themselves busy work mm. so that they can say i've done a lot of things because they, they just really really struggle mm. with mm. that what fe- must feel very directions mm. 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 yeah i think that um, it might be worth trying to find other employee number ones and having a chat with them rather than chatting to the founder because every founder is different mm. and the circumstances are different every time as well and some might be really really receptive to being up front with them others might not be mm. they might be really stressed out with the whole thing and, and more stress and as you've as you've sort of alluded to there I also find it stressful and maybe everyone does when people say right tell me what to do today because you're almost micromanaging them yeah. and you've already micromanaging your own diary and everything you're doing and I think it's people are really good if you just say this is the vision here's your overall strategy here's the resources yeah. I'm not going to interfere just go on and and, yeah. and 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 do amazing I think the one thing I probably learned and that that's very much my ethos this is where we're going mm-hmm. you have autonomy mm-hmm. get on with it and I think one of the things I did learn mm-hmm. And again, um, we talk about it in the, the episode with Regina, and it was her that really highlighted this to me. The downside of that is that you have to check in a little bit more mm. than your natural inclination is to. Yeah. So your natural inclination is like, I, you've bought into the vision, I trust you, I give you autonomy, mm. go and make it so. But I think I did make the mistake of assuming because that all the autonomy was there. It was therefore all working. And there were some areas where I took my eye off a lot because they they were my area of least expertise. And it took me a hell of a lot longer than I should have done to realise that entire function wasn't Mm. working. Do you think that, um, you know, in this instance and, and in your experience, that if they were to sit down with the founder and talk through the plan the business plan or the growth strategy, the hiring strategy, they could by default almost land on this topic of conversation without forcing it. So they're talking about expanding in terms of roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. You could subtly then go, right, so what are ours now? And what do we need in time? Because that's also a difficult thing. Planning is the first time CEO is very difficult. People who have been in big corporates and have got lots of experience are tend to be, in my experience, very good at planning. Mm -hmm. Mapping out roadmaps, giving leeway, you know, looking at the PL. Entrepreneurs, especially if they're first time, have just got no idea. They've got absolutely no idea about what to do and when. So maybe giving them a hand on that could allow you to yeah. kind of get to that topic of conversation. And it sounds like she she feels like it's not something she can easily bring up, which is why yeah. she's asked the podcast. Right? Yeah, and and it's very frustrating for both sides of that when mm. you are like the, the founder can probably have easily convinced themselves they're too busy to delegate. Yes. I mean, I, 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 hate, I hate anything that's the basic admin of the business. Mm. Right? But I'm trying to work right now with three, four co-founders trying mm. to set up like basically a cooperative project. <laughs> Fascinating. Which, of course, requires like administrative tasks ninja tasks mm, 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 and mm, 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 you know my the person i work closely with is a rope mm. trolley ball for this need to ship you know, you put things on here i'll pick them up and assign them and we'll do all of this but even then it really i mm. wanted to convince myself you know i uh, i i just i'm too busy to spend mm. like an entire mm. day creating all of this trello stuff yeah but actually it's because I don't. It's not because I'm too busy, frankly. It's because I don't want to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm, what What do you do then? Because I, I think I think we're very similar. Um, There's a million things happening at any one time. So on top of um, you know, the degree and all that kind of stuff. I had my own personal fitness yeah. goals. I had um, some books I wanted to read. All this kind of stuff. All so many things going on all the time. And also meeting interesting entrepreneurs is high up on my list. That's, yeah. that's the thing I like to do. Oh, I, I like think to that's interesting essential people. to your personal development, actually. Yeah. Meeting personal interesting and people. And... Do you know what? My crazy, my method mm. is is awful, but it works for me. Okay. I have as big a pad, yeah. like paper pad, as I can possibly fit mm-hmm. in my bag or carry. Like my ideal is like a big sort of A2 pad. Okay. And I just draw this stuff. And I just tend to draw a grid. And it has all kind of random stuff in it. It's like people, money. This project, 
I mean, it looks like I ex- I've exploded my head onto a page, and I, I do suspect that people working around me probably think I was insane and chaotic. <laughs> but it worked for me. Mm-hmm. It really worked for me. Mm-hmm. I think most um, most founders are quite chaotic, aren't they? I mean, you have to be, um, unless you've you've sort of pivoted off from a, a very successful or a long executive career and you're starting a business. And I think they would approach a startup differently to your first time founder with little in the way of experience would approach a, mm. a, a, a startup as well. So it would be interesting to learn more about what the founders actually like, what background yeah. have they come from, what background has the, the employee come from, uh, and then you know you could revisit it and, and come mm. up with a plan of action. But it's yeah. all about people, isn't it, and personalities, because yeah. you don't want to annoy the founder. <laughs> no, but, and, and I suppose, I mean, I think it would be quite interesting in how much this is all about vision. Mm. You know, if, if what the founder is afraid of letting go of is... Mm the shape of the vision, mm. that's a really different mm. thing mm. to somebody who's... Well, maybe we should talk about that. That might, <laughs> that might be interesting to some of your listeners because, I mean, like, so both of us have taken a business to a stage where it's transitioning or is has transitioned or is just about to transition from being a founder business to a business with a founder in it, mm. right? And people like Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos and Michael Dell and Bill Gates seem to have just got incredibly lucky as well as being incredibly amazing and have managed to retain so much of their business which has grown so big and that's really unusual yeah. normally when you raise a couple of rounds of capital it becomes a business with a founder not mm-hmm. the founder yeah. and the business airbnb i think are... yeah i think there's some research by year three mm. right year, by year three i think 50 percent of CEO, mm. 50 percent of founders who were ceo founders are no longer and i think by year five or something it was 80 percent. fascinating yeah and and then uh, maybe the founders in those businesses didn't want to be the ceo as it grows and gets bigger and bigger but the, the difference between the Zuckerbergs and, and the other founders, I think, is that they are not on the CEO, they still have control. Yeah. And they're such a big business, right? And, and there's, there's been research done around this, which mm. is what, what when the CEO is mm. replaced, mm. whether that succeeds or not, mm. it, a lot of that comes down to share, share ownership with the company. Fascinating. And, and I've met a few people who've said, like, I'm CEO, mm. but I'm desperate to find a CEO mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I want to get back to inventing or doing mm. whatever I want. Mm. There's, I've seen other people where I've gone, I've thought to myself, damn, this company would be so much better if you weren't the yeah. CEO. Yeah. And I personally was always, I was open mm-hmm. to, I actually was prepared that at some point I would step away mm-hmm. from being CEO, and especially that's... when it was getting into scaling and the CEO mm-hmm. job was going to become like really kind a lot of, admin. of like, admin-y. <laughs> admin Admin um, process. Like, the second just gets admin I'm out. Um, <laughs> But my frustration, I suppose, was I wasn't ready. Mm. I, like, mm. fundamentally mm. disagreed that that was the right mm. time to do that. Mm. I fundamentally disagreed. Mm. Now, even then, mm. I can say all this coming out of my non-compete, non-disclosed mm. agreement now. Mm-hmm. Even then, mm. I did go into my resignation period as open as possible to finding a, fa- a, finding a CEO sure. I could work with as a founder. Sure. And I think... I personally believe that that's it's the optimum way to do that is actually sure. keep the founder engaged yeah. until you have found a CEO you can all work with and yeah. who's going to take the business where it needs to go. Mm. What do you, I mean? Are you, are you able to talk about it? Yeah. yeah. What, about what do it, you yeah. want as a founder CEO? Yeah. Where you are at this point in time? Well, just I guess for, to to give the listeners some perspective on on the situation. Um, as of August the 1st, I'm going to be working in the hospital as a, a part-time junior doctor. And the ambition, or my vision, is to get my full registration and license to practice from the General Medical Council. Mm-hmm. And you need to actually practice medicine to get that. You get your uh, degree in medicine from the university and you can call yourself doctor mm-hmm. XYZ, but you don't have a license to practice and you're not registered until you've actually applied all your learning in mm-hmm. the hospital. I really want to do that. And that's not because I see a career as a hospital physician for the rest of my life. Far from it. I see myself, you know, being the CEO of a big, big, awesome company that scaled wildly Mm -hmm. with great values and huge impact. But I think to get there, I need to do my time in the hospital and learn what it's like to be a doctor. Because if I'm going to be building businesses, which are building relationships with doctors and hospitals for the rest of my life, I need to understand what it's like and I feel like it's really important for me to, to complete my skill set in doing so. So in light of that we are 
or where we are recruiting or have been recruiting a new CEO for Enterobiotics, the company. And it was a mix of me putting forth that suggestion to our board and investors and them suggesting it as well. Mm-hmm. It, was, it wasn't forced by, mm-hmm. by either of us. Having lived this double life for the last few years, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to manage it all. And um, the roles and responsibilities as a CEO are changing as the business gets bigger. So there's nine of us now, seven FTE and a mm-hmm. couple of consultants. We want to double or triple a head count within the next 12 to 18 months. So we're, we're growing pretty quickly. And we're raising a lot more money than we did when we did the seed round. So I myself kind of said, I don't, I don't know if I'm ready quite yet to be that CEO. And I think we would maybe have more chance of success if we brought someone else in who does have that skill set and I can continue to add value in other ways. Mm. So basically, I think it's a good thing for enterobiotics to have someone else take the reins whilst I'm still developing. And it's such a key and critical moment in the business's life. And I'm also um, basically saying to our shareholders and prospective investors that I'm going to be not spending all day, every day, or nine to five anyways, as per my contract, in enterobiotics, because I'm going to be in the hospital. Mm. So I think it's, it's entirely reasonable to say that someone else will be fulfilling that role full time, and I'll be adding value whilst I complete my FY1. For me, if it's a CEO that I can look up to and learn from, then it's a huge win. Because in tandem, we're going to be increasing the value of our business, increasing our impact, growing it quickly. And I'm going to be learning as well about what I need to do to be that CEO that I want to be in 10 years or whenever Mm -hmm. it is. The CEO of the global pharma company, preferably one that I've started. And it's amazing if you meet that person. I mean, I met somebody and she worked with us for a little while as an advisor in my last business. And it's like, if I could have got her, I would have been doing a happy dance yeah. to kind of work alongside her with yeah. her as CEO yeah. and me doing the stuff that I yeah. can do. Yeah, because I guess that there's only so far your skill set and experience stretches. Uh, and I think that when you're starting a business, you can pretty much learn by doing. But once it hits, once it reaches a certain size and a certain scale and you're raising bigger tickets of investment, then you need experience people to, to manage that because otherwise a mistake could be you know, Yeah, I think I think... If you if you look around your business and it, within your personal skill set, mm. the skill set of your closest advisors and yeah. board, yeah. there's too many big knowledge gaps yeah. that none of you can actually confidently verify sure. if you have filled with the absolute best competency sure. and, and skill mix available. Yeah, there comes a point in your own business, depending how far away it has moved from your core yeah. personal competencies. Yeah. I mean, certainly I, I know on the software development and the software as a service side of my yeah. business, you know, that wasn't my core technical competency. Mm. So I had a lot to learn, mm. which meant that I wasn't as good yeah. at hiring the right competencies mm. at the right time in mm. that whole side of the business. Yeah, I think every founder should ask themselves all the time, am I still in the best job for me and the company? And just because you're the founder doesn't mean it's a given that you have to mm. be the CEO the entire time. It depends on your skill set, it depends on your wants and desires and ambitions. You know, when my foundation training is, is, is complete and, and I've got my license to practice, then I'm, I am going to be planning on joining Interobiotics again full, full time. But I've said to, to the board and the incoming CEO that that doesn't necessarily mean at all that I have any sort of preconceived demand about absolutely being the CEO again. Because if it's going amazingly well, and I'm in a fulfilling role, then that's absolutely spot on. That's absolutely perfect. And I'm only 25 now, so I've got a whole career ahead of me to be the CEO again. Mm -hmm. And learning and observing from someone that's amazing sounds like an excellent apprenticeship for me right now. And I've had that experience of taking something from concept to multi-million pound valuation, something tangible, product, soon to be a license I hope to sell into the hospital and people getting better. And that for me is, is a fantastic learning experience i think you need to bed that down now consolidate uh and basically develop the rest of my skill set so when it does come the time again to be the ceo i'm ready for action and i'm coming into that role with a fresh set of skills new perspectives shared loads of experience cool calm head but also hopefully lots of energy Mm -hmm. some more experience in the processes and and (laughs) and, and, and (laughs) these kind of things and you um, found love of numbers. Mi- yeah, the numbers, yeah. I'm going to get really good at numbers. <laughs> get poetic about the PL. That's it. I'm going to be. When you're poetic PNL about master. the PL, it will be time. <laughs> PL master. 
<laughs> oh man so yeah I, I in summary i think it's a really exciting time for me as the founder bringing in someone amazing to the business yes. and together with gregor the coo and the rest of our team and the board and our existing shareholders and new perspective hopefully investors uh, it's a really exciting time when we can all work together to take this business to to where i think it can go I think, James, that that's an incredibly mature, refreshing, <laughs> inspiring perspective. And I wish you absolutely every success. Thank you. You've been listening to Vicky Brock and James McElroy on the Entrepreneur Agony Ant podcast. And you can submit your question at vickybrock.com slash podcast. Uh-huh.